Some get to 11 and some are at 9, but we're at 10% of the people doing 100% of the work. Three, listen, 3% of church-going Christians tithe. 3. 8% of Christians in America read their Bible every day. 8% of us. We have our prayer meetings here, right? Not condemning you. I'm just, hopefully it's convicting for you. We have prayer meetings here three times a week. Monday night, Wednesday night, Saturday morning. Four people. Four. So if there's 50 people in a room, four of them are here. What's that? 46 people found something other than that to do. Maybe it's legit, maybe it's not. I just say search your soul, right? Search yourself. See if, see if what you did during those times is more pressing. If it's you're out actually feeding a homeless guy in the name of Jesus and you're down kneeling at his blanket talking to him, blow off the prayer meeting, y'all. Right? Do it. But just check and see what you're doing. See, we all... I, know, I could go across the room and I could ask you and, you, and and you might tell me the truth or you might not, I don't know, but if I ask you... Do, 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 don't you think that God really wants you all engaged in the daily activity of building his kingdom? Like, yeah. all of you would say yes. I mean, no one's going to say no. He doesn't want me to do it. Like, no one's going to say that. But there's this chasm between what you say and think and what you do. There's a chasm in that in every single church in this country. Some are doing better at that than others. But generally speaking, that is the reality in the church. We all know that. And so... This series right here, this God's Unhero series, is a blatant attempt on your pastor's behalf to change this reality. Like, I'm not, so here I am, transparent and open, right? I'm not hiding anything. Get in the game. Get in the game, right? Get in the game. Get in the game. But I understand that saying get in the game is not going to motivate you. As a matter of fact, some of you might say, as I'm yelling at you, get in the game, you might be putting up your wall and digging in your heels deeper because you don't like to be yelled at. You don't like to be told what to do. And I understand all that. But I would say that my blatant attempt to bust those odds, bust those statistics and not be not engaged, but a fully engaged church is blatantly written in the pages of scripture blatantly written in the pages of scripture the bible that you right now hold in your hand and swear up and down that is the truth that guides your life and the bible absolutely says get in the game i re reference this verse all the time michael and jerome and all those guys they wrote this for me as a reminder as i get up here and preach that's not about me or you or anyone else it's for him everything was created by him and for him and I'm standing here before you this morning for him. And, and I watched a message yesterday that, just, that, that, that crushes me but inspires that when a man stands up before people and faithfully, I'm talking about faithfully, preaches the word of God. If, this, if every word is inspired by God, right, then when I say it, it's as if, listen, give me grace in this, it's as if Jesus was standing here saying it to you. This is his word, right? The word that, that when he spoke it, planets came out of his mouth. That kind of powerful word. And it's here. And so this Bible is his word to you. And he is blatantly coming after your, your loyalty. Your divided heart, right? He wants all of you, all of you. Does that make sense? All of you, all of you. Every bit of you. It's your breath in my lungs. So I pour out my praise to you only. And, and he wants you to live that. Let your life be a praise to him, right? That's what we're looking for in this study. So pray with me. That's a task. That's a massive task. And I understand our unwillingness to give in and our desire to hold firm and white-knuckling my life. And he said, you, if you hold on to your life, you lose it. And God, you love us too much for us to live that way. That's not what you want. You said you came that we have life in abundance. And ho oh, how we long to live that way, Lord, but we settle for so little. I think it was C.S. Lewis, Lord, your man that 
talked about how we are too often rolling around in mud puddles thinking that's the best when all the while you want to give us a cruise. And that's our life down on the bottom shelf looking for the bargains, looking for the dollar candy when up high is the filet that you want us to eat. And that's what you want for us, and Lord. That's our desire. But there's things that battle in the way of this thing. And so, Holy Spirit of God, I'm pleading with you now. I'm just pleading with you, God, that today we might hear your voice. That you would use this powerless man. And I know it to be true. <laughs> oh, I know it to be true. But that you would use this powerless man to speak your powerful word. And, and I believe I am, I, am, I am naive and silly enough, Lord, to believe you at your word when it says that your word will go forth and will not return void. That it will accomplish that which you set it out to accomplish. And so, Lord, I pray that today statistics would change and no longer would it be the select few that engage into the process of advancing your kingdom, but that today we would live into, in a greater way, our calling to be ambassadors for Christ, to be your spokesperson, making your plea through me, through name your name, through you. Come back to God. Come back to God. That's the task at hand, Lord. We know that it's difficult, so please give us the grace and power to do this. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So God created everything way back when at the beginning of your Bible. There you see that he creates everything, and when he gets done with creating it, what does he say? He says, hey, this is really good, right? He's pleased with the way things worked out, right? He had a plan in his mind. He had, did, you ever, did you ever get, you know, like you get done with a job and you look, you like, you stand back, right? You guys cut lawns for a long time and you cut lawns still too. And, and you know, maybe it gets a little mundane, but when you get to a lawn, it looks terrible. And then you, you I, I cut lawns with you guys and then you load up your mower and as you drive away, maybe you took a, look over and you take a little glance at the yard and you go, hey, you know, I know it's just a lawn. I've cut that grass 50 times, but that looks pretty nice, you know? And it feels good. And so God gets done with his creation, and he looks at it, he says, not just that it's good. What does he say? It's really good. Right? But then shortly after that, Adam and Eve come along, and, and they, get, they get duped by Satan, and they sin, and all of a sudden, well, that which was really good ain't so good anymore, right? And, and, and we know this, uh, not only by scripture, but by reality of life, we understand that that sin nature is carried on. And, and, and the Bible would tell us, it's so true, that since then, every person is born with this sin nature. It's just been passed down generation after generation from Adam and Eve right to, raise your hand, right, to you and I. Now, way back when he also not only did he create something that was very good, but he told his creation, be fruitful and multiply. And, fruit, and being fruitful and multiplying is a lot of fun. Amen? So, so we, we are fruitful and we multiply. Amen times 10. Right? So, so, but as a result of all of this, right, because of your sin and because of your multiplying, it's funny how you were obedient with one thing but not in the other. Right? <laughs> Yeah, right? Because of our sin and because of our obedience to multiply, what we have now is this human race, an entire human race that Romans 1 would say this about the human race, that we all know God. We all know that there's a God, but we suppress the truth of this. We suppress the truth of this reality that there's a God, and we refuse to live under his lordship. Romans 3 goes on and says that no one is righteous, no, not even one. No one is truly seeking God. All, all, everyone have turned away. Every single human being. 
And so left to our own devices, and we, we read the Bible, we know it's true, and then we look in the mirror, we look at society, we know absolutely God's telling the truth right here, right? We know that we're left up to our own devices, no matter what year it is, no matter what nation you live in, you will not live the way God had intended. He would not look at anyone's life, even though some are better, I guess, than others, but no, no person could live his life, walk up to God, and God would look and say, that's truly good. This is really good. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say, no one is good. Jesus even said it. No one's good. Only God is good, right? No one would live a life that God would look at and say, that was really, really good. So here's the deal. We will not live right. We won't. And God knows this. And so he, praise God, he has to do something. Because he, he made a, a world that was really good. And we, and we read it, right? And we're like, yeah, if we all got along with each other and we loved the Lord, right? It would be great. We all would say that, wouldn't you? But no one's doing it, right? Even us that say, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. You won't and I don't either. And so God has to do something about it because if it's up to us, we will not live appropriately. So he does it. So how does God do this calling back to him how does God restore a relationship with his very good creation that not only restores the relationship but as a result of this restoration we would actually live in a way that is truly good right so that this human flourishing instead of what you see on tv human fighting human hate Human death, right? Human war. How does he do this? Well, he does it by invading your space because you're stubborn and so am I. He, I don't know how to say this, so please hear me right, but because I made my own choices to wreck my own life. But I would just say that there's a dance going on between God and me and God and you. And not only are you making choices, but he's wrecking you to the point where you realize, oh, God, help me. Right? So when I'm making my choice to sin for 30 plus years, living in the dregs of society, waking up in the bushes, drunk, covered in my own urine, that was my choice. But God's like, you want that? Have it till you choke on it, boy. And when you're ready, I'm right here. And so he brought me. How does he, how does he change this sickening world? He invades your space. And then he invades the space of, of people like you and I, unlikely folks, just like you and I, the, the foolish ones. <laughs> oh, was I foolish, right? I just admitted my thing, Right? Don't leave me up here. Anyone else in the bushes? Golly, we're pathetic. You guys are awful. Bunch of preachers up in here, I think. Awesome, right? So he invades the space. He, he chooses the foolish and the powerless, right? And they win wars. And they split seas. And they become prophets and kings, right? All for the glory of God. And all their life as a testimony to grab the masses, their audience, whoever that is, and point them back to God. That's what he does. And here's the good news for you and me. This, this task of reconciling the world back to him, of, of you making disciples of all people, and being his witnesses to seven, over now, over seven billion people across the earth. That task is daunting. And then you look at yourself and you're like, I was drunk in the bushes in my own urine. How can you use me to do that? Anyone there, right? But here's the great news. The worse that you were, the more unlikely you were, the greater the achievement seems to be. Like it's crazy, right? It gives you hope. If you were the guy in the bushes, you should start, something should swell up in you right now going, hey man, I'm just the guy for him. And no one would have told you that. They're all yelling at you as they should have. What's wrong with you, boy? Get your act together. Wake up. Come on. And God's like, that's my guy down there. 
It's crazy. But his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Even as the heavens are above the earth, so are his thoughts and ways above yours. God doesn't see things the way that you see them, praise the Lord. So it seems crazy to say what I'm about to say, but it does seem as if, when we look back in the redemptive story of God, it seems as if the worse you are, the more unlikely you are, the greater success you should expect. Come on now, right? Who would say such a thing other than the Lord Jesus? Look at these people that we've studied. Moses, the murderer, fugitive, shepherd. Who are you to lead the nation of Israel out of bondage from the most powerful man on earth who thought himself a god? Rahab, the lying prostitute to help win battles? Gideon, the dire of a wimpy kid? who leads the great armies of Israel to victory? Peter, the, the uneducated failure of a man who's a fisherman? David, who played the harp. But today I want to focus on the poster child of the unqualified and the unlikely. This is how he would describe himself in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. I am the worst sinner of them all. Some of you King James folks would say, I'm the chief sinner. The worst person there is. So just imagine, you go to the playground, right? I'm going to choose teams, right? Colby, come here a second. I'm going to choose teams. And we're on the playground, and we're going to play basketball, right? And so I'm, I'm a captain, and there's the other captain. Here, you're the captain. Come here, captain. Come here, captain. Here's a captain right over here, right? But I get first dibs, right? I get first dibs. We're playing basketball, right? Right? I'll choose Mimi. <laughs> what are you laughing about? You did, did they do a great job? Well, that was so awesome. Give me a hand. Yeah, great job. I choose Mimi. Of course I would. She's on a walker. Why wouldn't I choose her to play basketball, right? Who does such a thing? God does. <laughs> Why does he do that? Oh, look, there's my second string quarterback right here. Another walker. Perfect. Perfect for the job. I know we're picking football teams, Lord. Herb seems like the one, but I'll take her. Doesn't seem right, does it? I'm the worst of sinners. The worst of sinners. Now having thought this through this week in preparation for this to, to talk to you about, about this message, I thought best, like, let's not start out with listing his sin. But let's start out this way. Let's, let's show the credibility. Let's show the, the, the possibilities. Let's show how awesome God can use a life by listing this man's um, amazing missional kingdom building achievements okay you ready for these okay acts chapter you don't have to go there just listen acts chapter 13 he preaches in antioch and this is what the bible says happens when the people heard this they were very glad and they thanked the lord for his message now i don't know i don't know what message they were thanking were they thanking paul for his message or were they thanking the lord for his message through this man I don't know because it doesn't say. But they were very thankful for the message that they heard as if it was the Lord himself. And all who were chosen for eternal life became believers. Watch this. So the Lord's message spread throughout the region. Grow, 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 grow. Not just that church, not just that town. What? What was the word there? Region. Like a whole area. Let's just think Lake County for a second. Through that whole area. Maybe, maybe central Florida. Maybe Florida itself, right? The word of the Lord spread because of his faithful message. Very next chapter, in Acts chapter 14, in, in verse 1, he's now in Iconium. And, and, and guess what? He did it again. He preached again. And it says in the, in the scriptures, and with such power he preached that a great number of Jews and Gentiles became believers. Grow, 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 grow more, right? And then in that same chapter, this is what God does. He heals. Hey, Nancy, what's up? Love you. So, 
And so then God, right, God does this to this man. He heals a man who's been crippled since birth, right, this way. Paul, this guy looks at him. I gave away his name, didn't I? Paul looks at him and says, stand up and walk. That's it, right? No, nothing aggressive, no slapping him, not shaking him, right? Didn't even lay hands on him. Stand up and walk. And the guy stands up and begins to walk. That's what's happening there. Acts chapter 16 he casts out a demon out of a fortune-telling slave girl. That's good, right? Yeah, because of that, he got arrested. He gets arrested, which is what? Good or bad? Generally, it would be bad, right? Who, who in here wants to get arrested today? Anyone have an arrested party? Come on, let's get some, let's get some, let's see everyone get arrested today, right? Nobody wants to get arrested, but, but, but listen, circumstances don't mess with this guy, right? That's a message for some of us right here, right now including the person yelling at you. Circumstances should not affect you because when he was put in jail, which what? Stinks. He, he preaches the gospel to the prison guard and leads him and then his whole family to the Lord and they all get baptized, right? Right? Turning graves into gardens. Bum, 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 bum. That's what happens, right? And that should happen in your life. So it goes on. It says here after that in Acts 17... He preaches again, go figure, in Berea, and here's what it says, quote, as a result of the preaching, many, say many, many, many Jews and prominent Greeks believed, grow, 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 more grow, more grow. This one dude, man, unbelievable, Acts chapter 18, it says, many others in Corinth heard him preach and became believers and were baptized. What are we doing? Grow, 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 grow. Acts chapter 19, it says he goes to the synagogue and he begins to preach, go figure, in the synagogue, right? For what is, I think it said three months consecutively, right? So he would meet there on the Sabbath morning and we'd go and he would preach in the synagogue. But soon after that, that wasn't enough, right? Some people kind of came up against him, a little pushback. When you preach the gospel, guess what you're going to get? Pushback, right? So the pushback came as it always does, as it does for you and it does for me in our world even to this day. And so there's some pushback. So he's like, all right, y'all don't want it in the temple? I'll take it to a, a community building. Right, think library. It was a lecture hall in town. A guy named Tyrannus owned it. He takes it to the lecture hall, and, Paul, and this guy preaches, listen, loved ones, every day for two years. That's 730 consecutive days of preaching. Convicting. 730 days in a row he preaches and there's some results out of that type of commitment it says that everyone crazy everyone in the region of Asia heard the word of the Lord 730 days in a row they were having church that's why salvation was breaking out all over the place listen loved ones in the announcements today you're going to hear again about the three days four days in a row we're going to do it right here and and when i say that i, I even say that i know i can i see your faces it's all like oh he's going to ask us to come yeah, yeah right wednesday night thursday night friday night seven o'clock till god says go home maybe we won't I'm just telling you that, that, that Andy's coming, right? He's Latino. You know, he could get in the spirit and pray. All, he could play all night long, right? And then the next day, Pastor Dixon's coming. I'm just telling you right now, he's black. It may go seven, eight hours. We've already talked about that. We laughed and joked about it. He's like, he, we went to a service with him the other day. His wife said, we're going to try to get out of here in three hours. My kids were like, <laughs> yeah, I just, I was like, yeah, let's go, you know? And then Jack says, <laughs> well, I kept it under three. But they served lunch, so it was worth it. <sighs> so, so listen, Acts chapter 19, he preaches 730 days in a row. And everyone in the region of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Acts chapter 19 also, it says this about this guy. That when he, when he had a, uh, a booger rag, you know, a handkerchief. 
right? That, that when this book, anyone want to hold this thing? It has miracle power in it. No. Come on now. Come on. No. Right? Paul, oh, he said his name again. Pretend you didn't hear that. So, so, so when he had it, when Paul had this handkerchief, right, and and they took it, and Carl took it. Hey, come on, you be my my assistant, right? You gotta take my handkerchief. I'm just kidding. So, so they took this, right, and and they went over to people that that couldn't walk, right? People that were maybe sick or or, or and he, and they put the snot rag on on them, and they were healed. And those that had demons in them, they took the handkerchief and touched them with the handkerchief. And the, and the demon came out, right? That's crazy, right? Right, that's insane, right? Now, on top of all that, in Acts chapter 20, icing on the cake, ready? Paul raises a dead kid. <laughs> the kid falls out the window while Paul's preaching all night long. And we think, <laughs> this is awesome. Paul, Paul wrote the Bible, <laughs> And he preached all night long to get a point across. And we think we can do it every week in 30 minutes. <laughs> Preacher, don't, 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 don't go more than 30 or 45 minutes because you'll, you'll put the people to sleep. Well, good. Maybe they'll die and we'll raise them from the dead. <laughs> like, wh- what makes us think? Like, who's a better communicator than Paul? I'm just trying to quote his words. I'm terrible. He's awesome. And he's the worst of sinners. So what's that make me? We've got to do it in less than 30 minutes. This isn't dominoes, y'all. So he plants, listen, on top of that, he plants 14 churches. And then he writes 13, maybe if Hebrews is him, which I think personally it is, we argue because we're Christians. He writes at least 13 books of the Bible. So what's his name? Oh. Right, right, I can't let the cat out of the bat. So Paul, right? What, what, look what God does through this man. It's, it's amazing, right? So here's a good question for all of us. It should resonate with you, right? Before God did any of this through Paul, before he did it, before any of that awesome stuff happens, do you think that Paul had any idea that this stuff was going to happen? No one, right? Who, who, who wakes up in the morning before they're even saved and goes, you know what? I'm going to plant 14 churches. That's what I'm going to do with my life. I'm, there's a guy over there. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but there's a dead guy over there. I'm going to go raise him from the dead. Like No one is thinking all of that beforehand. You know what? I think I'm going to be one of the guys that's going to write the Bible. It's going to be awesome, right? People are going to be talking about what I'm doing for the next 2,000 years. No one ever thinks that way. And I would just take a wild guess and say that Paul never thought that either. But it's exactly what happened in Paul's life. What we need to do, here's the challenge, we need to stop comparing ourselves. Like when the book of Acts is telling you to go do for me, do for me, do for me, right? Do, 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 do. Respond this way. Give your bodies as a living sacrifice. Give everything to me, right? Go make witnesses of all, and be a witness to all the people. Make disciples of everybody. Go advance the kingdom of God. This is your purpose in life. You can do great things. The Spirit's in you. You got it. Well, before you have all that, you're like, he was Saul then. You're like, Saul, you're like, no one's thinking I can do this, right? So we need to stop comparing ourselves to the stand up and walk Paul. We've got to stop comparing ourselves in this pre-awesome condition. We've got to stop comparing ourselves to, I wrote the Bible, Paul. And we need to examine closely the pre-awesome Paul to see who God is. Not who Paul is, but who God is in response to who Paul is. He's nothing. He's nothing. So we have to look at pre-awesome Paul because I'm in pre-awesome Moses. You're in pre-awesome Haley. You're in pre-awesome Nancy, right? We're in pre-awesome everything. Now, how many people in here in this room have done incredible things for the Lord, right? On the new stuff. Not most. Most people in churches can't make that claim, but God would say to you that you can, that he wants you to do those things, that the spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Go, me, go be my ambassador to the people. May, let me make my plea through you. Look at mountains and make them move. Raise the, raise the dead. Cast out illness. Cast out demons. 
preach my word, advance my kingdom. And you're like, how can I do that? How can I do that? Well, that's why we're studying pre-awesome people. The most famous section of scripture that describes Paul's calling and his transformation, of course, if you've read the Bible at all, is Acts chapter 9. But I'm not, I don't want you to go there because I want, I want us to study in Acts chapter 22 because when, when, when Jesus says, hey, I want you to go do all this stuff for me, you kind of would look at yourself and go, well, I, who am I? Like Moses did, right? Who am I to do this? I can't advance your kingdom. I'm not Billy Graham, right? It's, that's, for, that's for certain. It's not me. I can't do this. We have a low view of ourselves. And so I don't want you to read Acts chapter 9. I want you to read Acts chapter 22 because even though all Scripture is God-breathed and useful to teach us the truth and God uses it to equip His people for every good work, it's all true. Everything's true. Nothing's more valuable than any other section. But Acts chapter 22 is Paul's words about himself. He gives the testimony, this is who I was, and this is what God did. This is what happened. So it adds a little bit of credibility to it because we're thinking, right? You're not thinking this morning, like Trevor Black's probably not thinking about, why won't Cece get off her butt and advance the kingdom of God? And she's not saying the same thing of him. She's probably saying, as he is, why won't I? Why won't I? Why haven't I done the things that God has called me to do? So I want us to see the words of Paul himself about himself. And that's why we're in Acts 22. Are you with me there? All right. I'm going to read. And it's a long section of scripture. But we love the word of God. So I'm sure that you will be very happy to hear it. So Acts chapter 22. I'm going to read all the way through to the 23rd verse. You ready? All right, brothers and esteemed, okay, so Paul gets arrested, right? And he's going to plead his case. He says, brothers and esteemed esteemed fathers, Paul said, listen to me as I offer my defense. He's going to lay out before you his life. When they heard him speaking their own language, the silence was even greater. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, and I was brought up and educated here in Jerusalem I just think like the height of academia, right? Like, like Boston is one of those places, you know, they got all these high, you know, MIT and Harvard and all that kind of stuff, you know? So he's in like the, he's in Jerusalem. He didn't just get brought up like and, and, and coached and taught and discipled, but he did it at Harvard, right? Right, that's what it's like. I'm educated here in Jerusalem under Gamaliel. Like this is like some famous rabbi of, of the day. And as his student, I was carefully trained in our Jewish laws and customs. I became very zealous to honor God in everything I did. That's good, right? We should all be zealous to serve the Lord, right? Getting after it, just like all of you today. And I persecuted the followers of the way. So the way was was Christianity. That's what we call it now, right? We just call it Christianity. But back then, they just called it the way because it wasn't so much what you believed. What was it? It was what? It's how you lived. It wasn't just what you believe. It's that what you believe moved into how you lived, right? Most people believe, like it says that the demons believe that there's one God, but they're not acting in loving, submissive obedience to the Lord. And some of us are like that. We believe things, but we're not living as if we do. And so, but, but, but the Christianity is not just a belief system, it's a belief way, right? So it's called the way. So he says, I persecuted the followers of the way, hounding some to death. Who's got a King James in front of him? What does it say? Not hounding some to death, but, what's it say? And I persecuted this way unto death. Unto death. Into prison, both men and women. Yeah. So, so, unto death, hounding some, delivering them to death, persecuting them to death, and arresting both men and women and throwing them in prison. The high priest and the whole council of elders can testify that this is so. For I received letters from them 
to our Jewish brothers in Damascus, authorizing me to bring the Christians from there to Jerusalem in chains to be punished. I was on the road approaching Damascus about noon. A very bright light from heaven suddenly shone down around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, that was his name originally, why are you persecuting me? Like his name changed. Think about that. If anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has died. Behold a new man. He's such a transformed man that you can't even call him. I can't call you Miranda anymore. That's how much of a change it would be. Like you'd be so, but she'd walk in and be so different that you'd feel a little uncomfortable even calling her by her name. Like who, who, who's that lady? That's, that's the change that's supposed to occur. So he has a new name and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Small L. He's like, yeah, I know that's something great that's talking to me, but I don't know what that is. He's kind of freaked out at first. He says, who, who are you, Lord? I asked, and the voice replied, I am Jesus, the Nazarene, the one you are persecuting. The people with me saw the light. I'm going to change this because this is an awful translation right here. King James would say the people saw the light, but they did not hear the voice. Okay? That's a proper translation. This one is not right. When it says the people with me saw the light, but didn't understand the voice, no, they didn't hear it. They saw the light. They did not hear the voice. Not everybody hears the voice of God. If you've heard the voice of God today or any day prior today, you are a very, very blessed man or woman. Not all people hear the voice of God. But Saul did. And he said, well, what should I do, Lord? And the Lord told me, get up and go into Damascus, and there you will be told everything you are to do. I found this strange. I... I, I talked to Meredith about this yesterday as I was reading this again in preparation. I found it strange that God is talking to Saul. Conversation right there, right? He's talking. Saul's listening. Saul's talking. The Lord is answering. And it's, a real, it's just a conversation, right? But yet he says, I want you to go to Damascus where you'll be told what to do. And, he, and you're going to see here he chooses this man Ananias to speak on his behalf to Paul. And I just started thinking about that. And my wife, she picked up on it right away. I hope you'll pick, on it, pick up on it right now too. God could have spoke to him right then and there. But he chooses you to speak to people. You see that? You're important. And sometimes his word comes from heaven like it did to Peter. When he taught Peter that Jesus is the Messiah. The anointed one. The holy son of God. Like sometimes you get that direct thing, right? And that's awesome, right? Who wants to hear from God? I do. But most often, it's through an Ananias. He wants to talk to you. He says, I want you to go to Damascus so I can speak to you through another person. And that happens. And so you may be that other person. I should, let's rephrase that. You're not, it's not you may be that other person. You are. You are that other person. I was blinded by the intense light and had to be led by the hand to Damascus by my companions. A man named Ananias lived there. He was a godly man, deeply devoted to the law, and well regarded to, by all the Jews of Damascus. He came and stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, regain your sight. And that very moment, I could see him. That's incorrect too. It's not happening in the moment. It was that very hour. I know it's a minute point because it's, it tells us the message that it happened pretty quickly. But I just don't want you to ever read scripture and not know. I want you to know, okay? I want you to know. I pray before I come out here every week, accuracy and clarity. Accuracy and clarity. I want you to know, okay? It didn't happen, boom, right then and there. And so when you're praying for someone, sometimes it doesn't happen, boom, right there. Sometimes there's a little bit of a delay. Sometimes God's doing something and we don't see it, okay? But he's doing something that very hour, he regained his sight, okay? So don't think that if you stop and pray for someone, if there's no healing right then and there, no deliverance right then and there, don't think it's not coming, okay? Don't lose hope. Keep knocking, keep asking, keep seeking, and you will find the door will be opened, okay? So then he says, 
then he told me, so this Ananias guy told Paul, the God of our ancestors has chosen you. Awesome, right? Awesome. And here's the thing, he chose you too. He chose you too. He chose you too. <laughs> the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will. Do you have a Bible? Let me see your Bible. He chose you to know his will. Isn't that so cool? Right? He chose you to know his will. Little old me. Little old me. He chose me to know his will. That's so incredible. That, I want you to understand if there's one thing we could do here in our church is I want to elevate the value and worth of the Bible. I want you to understand what you have in your hands. Right? So that maybe you'll go home and read it. Right? He chose you to know his will. This mystery in the kingdom of God, isn't there? Secret things of the Lord's, but praise God, he wrote, this It's like 810,000 words. No joke. 810, I need a word from the Lord. How about, you have 810,000 of them. He wants you to know his will. He chose you to know his will. Somehow, some way, he placed a Bible in your hands. Thank yeah, thank God. For you are to be his witness, telling everyone. What is Paul thinking right now? He chose me to tell. Now, there's more people on this earth right now than there was back then. I get it. I don't know how many people, I should have done that, I should have looked it up. An approximate, you could do that on Google. I don't know how accurate it is, but you can get an approximate world population at the time so so how does paul feel with with his history that we're about to unfold here how does paul feel with his history knowing that this mysterious voice of a guy that he knows is dead is speaking to him so he knows now he's real and this dude comes in his name and says he's chosen you you can see, to hear, to hear his voice, because now Paul's going, oh my goodness, I did hear his voice. Maybe this guy's right. And I'm going to be his witness to everyone? Holy moly. Talk about pressure. Do you think he ever saw this coming? Just like us, right? All this amazing stuff. You know, we never see anything coming. We're all blind. I was on my way here this morning. And you can pray for, I don't know if the guy's alive or not, but I got to the intersection by Lake Tire. You know, you know what I'm talking about. You know where Lake Tire is, right? By the fountains. And there was a massive motorcycle wreck. It didn't look good. Do you think he knew that was coming? Nobody sees this stuff coming. And here's Paul living his life the way he was living it. A voice comes down from heaven of the guy who's dead. And saying, it's me. You're going to be my witness telling everyone what you have seen and heard. Now, have you heard that? If that was spoken to you, what are some options on feelings? Scared? What would you say, Herb? No. I like that one. Probably laugh, right? Like, <laughs> right, sure. Okay, okay, God. Right? What have you been smoking? I hope you won't say that to God, but I, I get that. Sure, yeah. A Moses response? Who am I? Right? So, so, so I think, I think Paul's probably just a normal dude just like the rest of us. Like, he wouldn't be like, yeah. Let's do this right now. But God, what's God say? Through this man, Ananias. What are you waiting for? Like, it's like, why haven't you gotten up yet? What's wrong with you, right? What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. How many people have, have been taught and believe that, that Jesus saved Paul when he, on the road to Damascus, that he knocked him on his rear end and saved him? Raise your hand. No. You're wrong. That's when he got saved. 
He got knocked in his keister and was very, very aware of who Jesus was at that point. But look what he says. Now get up and call on the name of the Lord. Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Those who confess that Jesus is Lord and, and believe that God raised him from the dead, they shall be saved. That's when he gets, he gets saved right then and there, right? Right then and there he gets saved. <clears throat> After I return to Jerusalem, he gets up and he, and he returns to Jerusalem he was praying in the temple and fell into a trance. I saw a vision of Jesus saying to me, hurry. Do you, you see the sense of urgency when, G, when, when God is calling his people, right? What are you waiting for? Hurry up. Get up, right? Stand up and walk, right? None of this, well, you know, just hang out for a little while, see what happens. It's not like that with God. Hurry, leave Jerusalem for the people here won't accept your testimony about me. But Lord, Really? I argued, they certainly know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. I was in complete agreement when your witness Stephen was killed. I stood by and kept the coats they took off when they stoned him. But the Lord said to me, go. Excuse, excuse, reason, reason, rationalizing, I don't think, I don't know, I don't want... How much room is there? Like how much time did God spend negotiating with him? How, how, much, how, how much value were the excuses to the creator of heaven and earth? Like I, I know those things are bad, but what does God say? He doesn't even say, hey, listen, I understand. What does he say? Go! Go! For I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listened until Paul said that word. I wonder why that was the word that made them mad. Maybe it's because they're greedy and they didn't want to share God, right? You're going to send them to the Gentiles? Who are they to receive your grace? Who are they to receive your salvation? Who are they? And they got so mad, like, you're going to share our, our God with the, with the low-life Gentiles? They threw their, they, they yelled, they threw off their coats, and they tossed handfuls of dust into the air. Away with such a... They wanna, he isn't fit to live. All the rest of it was fine until they got to that part. When he says, God didn't say you're going to go to the undeserving people. If God is... I never understood that. If God is truly the one true God, why would he want other people to worship another God? If he's the only real God, you'd think Jewish people would recognize that. But they didn't. So, let's just take a, let's just make a list, if you will, of, uh, of Paul's qualifications to be called and used powerfully by God, right? So here's what I wrote down. Uh, un, he was educated, look at it says here, he was educated under, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but Gamaliel, Ga Gamaliel, I like Gamaliel. You want to choose that one? Gamaliel, just because it's really cool. So Gamaliel. So it says here he was brought up and educated there in Jerusalem under this guy, right? It says, as his student, I was carefully trained in our Jewish laws and customs. So he was definitely in-depth teaching. Awesome, right? And that's good. And, and look at it did. It actually, it, it, it stirred him up to action. And, and so that should be a good thing. Like anytime you come to church and you're listening to this, it should cause you to do something, right? It just shouldn't be added to the Rolodex or the, or the hard drive of your belief system, but that belief should inspire you to go do something, right? As each person does their own special work, it helps the whole thing grow. And so he was taught, carefully, trained, but a full education that would lead someone awry, how good's that education? You could sit there at school for years. There's a lot of argument right now in our school system here in our country. Yeah. What's being taught? Like you go to school for 12 years sometimes 13, sometimes 14, you're going to pre-K, then you go to, uh, uh, what is it called, uh, 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 
the pre k the pre k thing v p k I mean, you could be going to school for 13, 14 years and get a full education. But, but, just because you're there for a full education, if that education is leading you to do poor things, bad things, how good's the education? Now think about what's happening here. It says not only did he learn from this man... But he also got letters from all the leaders to go do these bad things. So, so these men that were teaching, they gave a full education. But think of the men who were teaching. What were they teaching? What was the fruit of their life? They, they knew the rules. They could spout it out. And they acted all high and holy. But they had no love. Right? It, that education did not transform those people. So this man, Paul, was fully educated, but that education sent him awry. It it sent him down a very bad path. So if this is the education he's receiving, if this is the fruit of his education, how good's his education? Well, look, it says here that as a result of this teaching, this education, this careful training, it said his actions were that he persecuted Christians unto death and sent them it says he went all over and he gathered up the 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 christians the, the followers of the way and he would bring them to jerusalem in chains to be punished look over in verse 19 but lord i argued they certainly know that in every synagogue i imprisoned and beat those who believed in you so he he beat them, he put them in prison, and he killed them. And it says, I was in complete agreement when your witness Stephen was killed. I stood by and kept the coats that that they took off when they stoned him. So so he was an accomplice. He was was part of that crime. These people were going to stone Stephen to death. Right? But, But see, like... Many of you noticed today that I was wearing a coat and you actually said, you know, hey, it looks nice and everything. I appreciate that. But listen, you know I'm not used to this, right? Why why don't I wear this thing? I mean, it looks, I'm not bragging, but I mean, it looks nice, right? I get it. But why don't, why don't you guys, why don't you men, right, when you, now you've retired some of you, right? Why aren't you putting a sport coat on every day? It's not very comfortable, is it? It's not as comfortable as just this. It's kind of restricting. It kind of gets in the way. And these guys wanted to kill Stephen. Right? But they wanted to get a good shot at him. Right? I want to, I want to really hurt him. So, so, so instead, of, instead of that, right? So I'd go up to, to Paul and I'd say, hey, listen. I want to get a good throw at this guy and kill him. So here, could you hold this for me? And, and, and he's like, yeah, sure, no problem. I'll hold your jacket so you can get a good shot at him and whip it at him and kill him. That's Paul. This is how he was living. You can chuck that down if you want. This is who, is he qualified? I understand that all sin is bad. It's wrong. It's bad. But of all the people that we've studied thus far, who just says the least qualified to do great, beautiful, powerful things for Jesus Christ? Is it, is it Moses who, who killed the guy? Like, that's bad that he killed the guy, but, but he killed an Egyptian who was whipping and beating one of the slaves. And so, like, I'm not, a, I'm not judge, jury, and executioner. I don't decide who lives or dies. I'm not God, but, but he was, that guy was beating that guy, right? So he can almost kind of, okay, I get it. I mean, I, I don't, no one should kill anybody, but, but I get it, right? He was being really, really awful to that dude. So he's just... Kind of doing the right thing, not doing... I don't know. There's some mixed reviews about that, but, but we can understand at least, right? It, was it Rahab who was a, a lying prostitute? I mean, she's, she's not... Qual- I mean, that's not really good. Is it Gideon, the, the, the wimpy kid who, who was afraid to do anything? and was, God was going to use that guy, the, the wimpiest of the wimps of a wimpy nation? Was it Samuel or David, just little kids? 
Were they, what was their resume like to do great things? Like when you look at, at David in the field as a kid playing a harp, watching sheep, does, when you look at him, do you go, yeah, that's the guy that's going to kill the giant and lead our nation to victory. No one's going to see that. Was it Peter, the uneducated chicken denier of Christ who was just a fisherman? Or is the least qualified Paul, the guy who was beating and imprisoning and killing Christians? I'm just, if we look at it for what it is, I'm just saying Paul is the least qualified. Not, not, listen, and it's not just that he did something wrong. That was his season of life. That's what he did. It wasn't like he went out and had a bad night. We've all had that. But we have seasons of life, right? Like this season of my life, since I became a Christian, I became owned. <laughs> this is what I'm, what are, you, what are you up to? People ask me that all the time. What are you up to? Just doing the Jesus church thing. That's what I'm doing. That's what I do, right? But before that, what was I, what was I doing? I, was, I, was, I, I wanted to make money. I want to sell cars, make money. Lie, cheat, steal, whatever it's got to do, got to make some money, right? Before that, I was, what I was doing, I was into golf. That was my thing. I love golf. Travel around, play golf, officiate golf, run golf tournaments. That was my thing. I was just into golf. Paul, what, what are you up to? I kill Christians. That's what I do. What are you doing tomorrow? Killing some Christians. What about next week? I got, my, my family's coming over. I can't. I got to go kill some Christians. Right? It wasn't just like he had a bad day. Like we all stumble and fall. The Bible says we all fail in many ways. Right, but but this guy, like this is what he did. This is who he was. I was a guy who persecuted, beat, imprisoned, and killed Christians, and helped others to kill them as well. This is what I was into. This is who Paul was. So I'm voting that the least qualified is Paul. And so now, when you think back to his statement in First Timothy one, he says, "I am the." worst of sinners when you look back at his life now now you're like i get it right i get it right and people ask this all the time i hate using christian cliches of how many people here have killed christians before you're better than him i I get that but i don't want to go there because i don't want you to think you're better than him i want you to understand you're worse than him you understand because the worse you are the more prepared you are (laughs) Right? The worst you are. Paul didn't look at other people and say, oh, they're terrible. No, he's like, no, I'm terrible. I'm terrible. We should all look at our sin. Listen, I was picking on you two earlier, right? When I look at you, I don't, when Jesus looks at you and he doesn't say, hey, listen, it was her fault that I went to the cross. That's not it. He looks at you and says, it's your sin that put me on the cross. And when he looks at her, he says, it's her sin that put me on the cross. And when he looks at you, he says, it's your sin that put me on the cross. We should all understand that your sin's the worst sin. The worst sin. You're the reason why Jesus went to the cross. I'm the reason why Jesus went to the cross. And Paul's like, I'm the worst sinner of all. And we're all really, really bad, okay? It makes sense when he says this. But what Paul says to you, listen, and I mean this, what he says to you in the verses to follow, that will set you free, right? That will set you free. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Look what he says here. He says, I'm going to start reading, you can catch up with me. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Okay? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Trustworthy saying, it's true, you should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I am the worst of them all. Okay? And when you realize you're the worst of them all, like he did, now watch this. This is awesome. This is his word to you. He was the worst, but here's the word for you. But God, that's always awesome, right? But God had mercy on me, right? Listen, not so that I could be blessed. Watch this. This is the word for you. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience to even the worst of sinners, right? You. He used me as an example so that he could speak to you, right? 
He said, God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience to even the worst sinners. Then others, there's you. Do you see yourself in the text? Then others, then I will realize that I too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Like if he'll do this for Paul, who was the, who was the, the guy who, this is what I do, I kill Christians. That's my gig. That's my life. I, I per, look at it, and it wasn't just killing Christians. What did Jesus say? You're persecuting me. These are my people. You're killing me. You're killing me. You're putting me in jail. You're persecuting me. Do you see the connection that Jesus has with you, loved ones? Someone hurts you, it hurts him. Someone blesses you, it blesses him. You're persecuting me. <laughs> Watch, this is awesome. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. All honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king. The unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. Amen, right? Awesome. That should set you free. If he can do this for Paul, he can do this for you. But, 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 right? But not only does Jesus transform the unqualified into a new person, not only does he do this, but watch this also back in our text in Acts chapter 22. Look what he says in verse 21. Go! I've saved you, you terrible sinner, persecuting me, killing my people. I've saved you. Now go. Now go. Verse 15, he was told by Ananias, you will be my witness for Christ telling everyone what you know. Verse 21, now go. Now go. It's not just get saved and called and then wait or simply sit and bask in the glory of your salvation. Although we should have times like that, right? You should definitely take time for that. That's our new thing around here right now, right? How's it going? What do we say? Great. Why? Because I'm saved. My car just broke down, but how are you doing? I'm great because I just got saved. In light of eternity and glory, how important is your Toyota? Not very, does right? It's got to be. It's got to be cognizant of this. Got to be thinking about this, right? Because guess what? Your Toyota. I know they don't break down, right? Toyotas don't break down. Your Toyota's breaking down. So is my Subaru that never breaks down. It's going to break down. So be prepared, right? What did Peter say? Don't be surprised by the fiery trials you're going to, going through, as if something. It was a surprise, a strange thing that's happening to you. No, no, it's coming. Your Subaru's breaking down. Now go. Don't just bask in the glory of your salvation. Go. It's get saved and go. That's what he told them, didn't he? Didn't he? Didn't he? Didn't he? Didn't he? he? Right? And what does he say to you? The Great Commission. All authority in heaven and earth is mine, says Jesus. Now what? Now go. Go what? Make disciples of who? All people. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then teach them to obey all that I've taught you. The words of Jesus Christ. Your Savior. Your King. Your Messiah. Your God. That's what he said. That's what he said. So, the overriding message of this series is that you're no different than any of these people that are in the Faith Hall of Fame. Pre-awesome, they are just like you. And as we preach every single week, whether it's Moses, Rahab, whoever, right? You know, you see a little bit of yourself in Moses, don't you? Who am I? Who am I to do this? Right? Yeah, I'm 80. I'm 80. Rahab? Her sin was lying in prostitution. Maybe you're not a prostitute, but you got something, right? All of us got stuff that we say, I don't know if you could use me, Lord. We all got that. Now go. 
So as you can clearly see in all these messages, you see yourself a little bit in all of these people. But God calls them because he chooses the foolish. And he chooses the powerless to go make disciples and to be his witness. So the question I have for you as we finish up here today is are you one of God's unheroes? It starts this way. Are you the worst of sinners? If Paul does anything, he uses, God uses Paul as an example for us. The worst of sinner. I'm the worst of sinners. I mean, that's pretty bold. But his admission of sin was the catapult to doing great things for God. Right, that's repentance. That's what we're looking for this week as we have our services this week, right? And this weekend as we gather to watch, to be part of the return. It's all about repentance. It's all about recognizing your sinful nature, recognizing your sin. And it, just acknowledging it, right? Just acknowledging, Lord, I am the worst of sinners. It's because of my sin that, Jesus, you went to the cross. And so, out of a thankful heart, we receive thanksgiving, we receive salvation, and then we are to follow his go order. Lord, even though I'm this, even though I did that, your grace is greater. And because I'm saved, I now go. But like what the Bible tells us is that there's, 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 there's this guy, Paul, who, who whipped and beat and imprisoned and killed Christians. And yet God used him to write the words that you and I read as the words of God that frame our life and determine our eternity that guy loved ones that just qualifies every single one of you to do great things to advance the gospel to build the church to advance the kingdom of God to be his witness to all people. Now's the time for repentance. Perhaps right now is the time to repent of our... Gosh, do I say laziness? Do I say complacency? Or perhaps it's just our lack of understanding prior to this moment when our understanding was that because of who I am and what I've done, I can't do what you call me to do. And I believe with all my heart right now, loved ones, as I speak to you, that God destroyed that lie right there today. That lie is gone. So when I say unprepared and unqualified, I now flip the switch and say, you who are a sinner are absolutely qualified to be used of God. Father, we thank you for the reality of who we, are, like who we really are. We are men and women created in your image who have been invaded by sin. And for too long, we've allowed that sin to dominate our thoughts and our actions. But today, by faith, we say no more. That we want to live for you. And we want to do exactly as you've called us to do, trusting 
that if we do what you say we're to do, that we will experience the best results. Once and for all, Lord, I pray that you demolish all fear of failure. That we are not afraid of failure anymore. When we obey you, God, we have already won. And the results are up to you. But we want to obey. Help us, Lord, by your Spirit, to be bold, to live for you, to do all that your Word is calling us to do. Trusting that your promises are always true and that you will always be with us in every single endeavor, in every perceived victory and every perceived failure, you are there. And because you are there, we are winners. We are victorious. I'm sorry for where I failed you, God. And I pray that you'll help me to do better. Lord, you've called us here to this local church to do our part to advance your kingdom in this community. And nowhere in your word does it say we should attack that with half-hearted effort. We should serve you with our whole heart. We should love you with our whole heart. We should make disciples of all people. That's what this church is for. Nothing more, nothing less. That's what it's for. When you gave us this place, and we put that sign on that building, it was for that purpose. That all that we do would point people back to you, Lord. So your kingdom would advance. And so now, Lord, we're going to generously give to that effort. Cheerful. Maybe afraid. But willing. So Lord, I pray right now that you would speak to every single person that's in this room and share with them what's on your heart for them personally about what giving looks like for them. How would you want them to partner with you to advance your kingdom? So loved ones, just pray. Talk to God. Hear his voice. He speaks. We've got to get quiet and listen. Let him speak to you. Just follow that lead. I don't care if he says give a nickel. Fine. 